Thank you, Devin. I appreciate it. And thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think today I'll just try and share a little bit around CO2 as a refrigerant um, technologies that can be found today with uh, advanced technologies, specifically around high ambient conditions. And then also just touch on some energy savings comparisons seen and done around the around the world when you're comparing CO2 with, for instance, R404A. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get into the presentation. Um, so basically, firstly, um, I would like to just touch on CO2 subcritical versus transcritical operation. Um, I have found that there sometimes is a confusion between the description of a plant being called a transcritical CO2 plant. Um, so the main differences between a subcritical and transcritical plant is just in the in the application or how it is operating. So for instance, a transcritical plant can operate in a subcritical manner when the um, ambient is is low enough or cold enough that it will be below the transcritical point, which is 31 degrees Celsius. So the confusion sometimes is that a transcritical plant operates only in a transcritical manner, um, but it actually is not so most of the areas. It's the ambient temperatures is fairly cold. And you would find that even a, a plant um, justified as called a transcritical plant will operate in a subcritical manner because of the ambient conditions of, of which it's seen. Um, so then basically also a lot of um, people ask me the questions around, is it only negatives or is there benefits between having a plant operate in a transcritical manner? Um, so basically, there are benefits actually of running a plant in um, the transcritical manner. The, the first benefit of it is that basically there is no pressure temperature correlation. What this means is that you do not condense your refrigerant on the high side. Um, so you also do not have a phase change. Um, so what you will find rather is a continuous drop or rejection of temperature. Um, as, as it goes down according to to the um, ambient conditions or the air conditions. Um, and that gives you the ability that you can have a closer approach when you're working in a transcritical mode. Um, so for instance, mostly you will find in a subcritical manner when you, con when you are condensing a refrigerant that you will allow for a temperature difference of about five to eight degrees Celsius between the refrigerant and the ambient air conditions. Uh, where with CO2 in a transcritical manner, this is about two degrees Celsius only because of the closer um, approach. So this means that you can still have a lower gas cooler outlet temperature, even at higher ambient conditions. Um, and sometimes the comparison that needs to be done when choosing a CO2 plant in the transcritical region um, needs to be taken into account that there is a closer approach. Um, Additional benefits comes when you are utilizing this for heating purposes, um, where you get a very good heat rejection method because of, of the, the, the capabilities and the properties of CO2 in its transcritical state. Then what is the main differences between a CO2 transcritical system? Because um, overall, a, CO, a basic CO2 transcritical system operates on the same parameters or same aspect as you would find a normal centralized Freon system with direct expansion. Um, so the main difference only comes in with the high pressure control and the, low pr and the flash gas control. So your discharge pressure being at a higher pressure than what we will see in um, conventional refrigerants uh, needs to be released to a lower pressure where you will form and especially when operating in the transcritical mode, um, you need to take your your gas that's in a um, in a or your refrigerants that's in a gas phase. You need to expand it into the two phase area so that you can create liquid. Um, while creating liquid, you're also creating vapor, um, and this means that you basically need to take care of that vapor and take it back to a compression cycle. Um, so this is where the, the two main control differences come in um, between the high pressure and the flash gas control valve. Um, benefits of this is you can basically determine where you are running your discharge pressure um, because you do have a high pressure valve controlling your optimum pressure. Um, this is also critical when it comes to the operation of the system where the, depending on what your gas cooler outlet is, which is determined by the ambient conditions, 
um, your controller will determine what is the optimum place for your system to operate to have the most efficient um, operation. So then going into some technologies that can be found. Um, so basically your standard system that was the birth of CO2, if you want to call it that, is your basic straightforward transcritical booster system. Um, this system basically, like I said, has the high pressure valve and the flash gas valve that's additional to what would be seen in conventional, conventional refrigerants. And therefore, basically, the rest of the system will operate in the same way. So this is a very simplistic way to have a CO2 system operate. Um, this type of system is suitable for subcritical applications, um, especially when it comes to efficiency of the system. So this system will be mostly seen in lower ambient conditions um, where you have predominantly colder areas and not very extremely high um, summer conditions. Um, so Northern Europe, Northern Americas, um, there is a lot where you will see this system operate. Um, so studies has been done to show what the efficiency gains can be from the transcritical booster, which is taken as the benchmark, and then adding additional technologies to, to get more energy efficiency when you're running at a higher ambient conditions. So basically for the transcritical booster system, a lot of studies that has been found is that up to an ambient condition of about 27 degrees Celsius, you will find that the CO2 system um, is more efficient than a standard R404A system making use of, um, also making use of variable speed drives, electronic expansion valves. Um, so basically that's why I say mostly subcritical um, operation for a transcritical booster system. Um, <clears throat> for this application here, I have looked at the ambient conditions of about 32 degrees Celsius to do energy efficiency comparisons. Um, seeing that that is quite a average high temperature for the Philippine um, area. So basically looking at a 32 degrees Celsius ambient CO2 compared to 404A when it's working as a transcritical booster system um, is about 11, 10% less efficient than a 404A system. Then moving on to additional technologies. So basically one of the first steps in introducing efficient um, technologies to a booster system is the introduction of a parallel compression system. So basically the main function of the parallel compression system is instead of with the booster system having the flash gas that is created in the receiver vessel um, be reduced to, to the suction of the medium temperature, um, compressors to be compressed from a lower pressure to the discharge pressure. This flash gas valve is now compressed by an additional compressor um, called the parallel compression set. And that compressor has then obviously working with a suction, suction pressure, which is equal to the receiver pressure. Um, so compression ratio within a system is directly related to uh, the energy efficiency of a system. So basically having a higher suction pressure and compressing the flash gas that's not doing any cooling work within the system to the same discharge pressure as the medium temp suction um, is what allows you for a higher energy efficiency. Um, of course, obviously operating in a transcritical mode, you can expect that after your high pressure valve, anything between up to 40 to 50% of the mass flow of the refrigerant going through your high pressure valve will be um, vapor at the end of the day, and 50 to 60% would be liquid that can be used for cooling purposes. Um, so looking at this, this technology has made CO2 more feasible and suitable for transcritical operation, and therefore also is a more suitable solution for higher ambient conditions. Um, comparing again to R404A, it has been found that this type system makes you more efficient or gives you the capability of being efficient um, up to ambient conditions of 37 degrees Celsius, which is quite a high temperature and does um, cater for predominantly most of the countries around the world. Um, looking at, a, at the set point of 32 degrees Celsius ambient, you will find that basically CO2 is, can be up to 7%. And depending on the technology and the installation and the setup, sometimes even higher. 
but on average about 7% energy efficiency gain on uh, compared to a 404A system. Then looking at additional systems, um, most recently the introduction of ejector systems into a refrigeration system um, has been introduced. The main reasons for this is because of the pressure differentials found within a CO2 system, um, there is a lot of energy losses or energy available to do work, um, basically work that can be replaced um, or that work that can replace work that would have been done by a compressor. So basically your ejector system replaces, in the case of being used as a high-pressure ejector, replaces your high-pressure valve. Um, and what this does for you, a certain percentage or, an, or sometimes even the full amount of the medium temp suction coming back from your evaporators can be lifted by the pressure differential created by your ejector. Um, and instead of going to your medium temp compressors, goes into your receiver pressure from where it then gets compressed by the parallel compression group. So the saving that you have from compressing the flash gas at a higher pressure, you're now basically doing free work and lifting some of your or all of your medium temp suction vapor into the receiver to be compressed by a higher compression um, com, um, pressure, um, suction pressure, sorry. Um, and then there's, but while still doing work at a lower pressure to, to obtain your efficiency. With the introduction of this technology, um, CO2 has been basically made to be energy efficient compared to um, any type of system and up to um, any ambient conditions. So this is definitely a suitable solution for extreme high ambient conditions and no additional um, allowances made for energy efficiency. Um, and at the ambient point of 32 degrees Celsius, 10% and more um, energy saving can be found for compared to an R404A system. Um, as mentioned, these savings are depicted at ambient conditions of about 32 degrees Celsius. Um, so the energy efficiency um, increase is obviously higher um, when it's running at lower ambient conditions like it is with energy, any other system. But compared to its Freon counterparts or 404A in this stage, the lower the ambient conditions as well, the more the energy efficiency gain would be. Um, the showcasing here is just specifically aimed at high ambient conditions to show that technologies um, do exist that make these systems feasible and energy efficient and not just um, environmentally friendly and sustainable solutions. Um, there are a lot of additional technologies as well. Um, I mean, the installation side of your CO2 system leads to energy efficiency. Um, so this is literally just comparing the specific technologies that can be utilized. Additional to the above mentioned technologies, um, these systems can also be equipped with adiabatic condensers or um, evaporative condensers. Adiabatic condensers just having the benefit of using or needing less water to do the work. Um, so basically what an adiabatic condenser does for you, it reduces your dry bulb ambient temperatures down to a wet bulb temperature. Uh, your wet bulb temperature always being lower than your ambient conditions. So basically you are manipulating the ambient conditions to be at a lower um, at the lower ambient, at the lower condition temperature, and that obviously then reduces your your um, operation of your system and leads to energy efficiency. Um, within the Philippines, the relative humidity is quite high. Um, on average, you're looking at about a relative humidity of 72 to 83 percent. Um, so, the Philippines basically consists of a natural adiabatic effect, um, and that's why we do see a very constant temperature through the through the Philippines regions. Um, in this, this does, however, lead to adiabatic condensers not having such a massive impact as it will have in dry ambient conditions, um, which is the most suitable applications for adiabatic and the most benefits can be obtained. But you can still have your ambient conditions basically reduced by up to six degrees Celsius by utilizing ambient conditions. So if there's water available, um, freely uh, or reclaimed to be utilized within these adiabatic condensers, you can have an additional 10 to 15% energy saving by utilizing adiabatic condensers. Then as we are, um, 
as we are obviously talking, comparing these technologies um, to ambient conditions, I just had a bit of a look at what can be seen within the Philippine regions. Um, so basically, I've included a graph showing the high ambient temperatures uh, over each month for a year period, then the minimum average temperatures, and then the daily average temperatures that can be seen in Manila. Um, so from this, as I've mentioned before, you can see that the Philippines do have a quite a constant ambient temperature, um, which from a design point of view, which, which will help me as well, makes it really suitable to design systems for the Philippines, as you do not have a very wide range in operating conditions. Um, <clears throat> but the main outcome of what, I've, what I can see when looking at um, ambient conditions that you will find in, in the Philippine regions is that from looking at the technologies before is that CO2 transcritical booster system um, fitted with parallel compression would be a very suitable solution for the Philippine market as the average temperatures is well below 30 degrees Celsius year on. And even your worst case high ambient conditions that you can see is up to 34, still below 35 degrees Celsius, where your parallel compression systems still make you more energy efficient up to 37 degrees Celsius ambient. Um, so that is basically just from my input to my point of view, probably a little bit of a guideline to say that that is where you would want to see your technology or what type of technology you would like to introduce into the Philippine market. Um, obviously, as more experience is gained, um, there can be looking at additional technologies like the ejector systems to further increase um, energy efficiency and making it just more suitable and adaptable for the Philippine market. And with that, we, yes, we basically, I am joined today by Ricardo Baptista from Cubicle International based in South Africa. Um, they have been kind enough to allow me to to utilize their training facility um, so that we can just have a little bit of a, a I would want to say a hands-on experience, but I think in this stage, a, a live web sneak peek into a training facility. Um, I hope everybody can, can see well, perhaps you can make the, the camera on your browser um, a little bit larger um, as we won't be showing presentation currently, but we will be focusing on, on Ricardo's camera. Um, so the one thing with the facility here is it is a, it's, it's the, the nice thing about this training facility is it is set up to, um, to mimic and look uh, a lot like what you would find in a refrigeration application within a real store. Um, and that's quite one thing I think is important when looking at a training facility is that once people have their hands and technicians can get their hands on and to start working on these facilities is that they know that once they go into the field, they find similar, they find similar components and ex or even exact same components and have much more experience and feel much free, much more free and willing to, to work on these systems. Um, so I do, do recommend and I do think that it's good to have a little, not a lab type um, setup, but more uh, uh, what you would find in real life. So the training facility that we do have here is a parallel system, um, basically CO2 transcritical booster system fitted with parallel compression. Um, so this facility, as you can see, is spread out and made to be worked on and um, have hands on it. So it's also been taken apart and put together a few times and have had a, quite a few hands on top of it. Um, so just a few things on the far left. Um, I don't know if it's clear enough, but you do see your high pressure valve that I've mentioned before that is regulating your discharge pressure into your receiver pressure. Um, then one thing with CO2 as well is because of the high pressures and utilizing XHP or CO2 or, or um, a copper alloy, um, copper iron alloy, you really have a sturdy system. So most of the CO2 systems is solid mount. Um, and that also needs to have then obviously a proper frame to allow you to, um, to absorb the vibrations and to work through the system through as a solid mount system. 
Um, within a CO2 system, and especially this being a training facility, there is a lot of access points. Um, most of the access points is suited, suited and equipped with a small little ball valve. Um, the reason for that is just makes ease for the technicians to tap into or connect to the CO2 system. Uh, so you can have your go, um, gauges and hoses connected to the to the system, and then only after that um, open the pressure valve um, to release the CO2 pressure or to open yourself into the system. Um, this just gives a little bit more um, uh, peace of mind in connecting into a system that you don't need to tap into a high pressure system. Um, so basically, I think Ricardo, if you can maybe show us the the um, gauges. So looking at the gauges, we have a nice cool ambient condition today. So we're running in a transcritical manner of about 63, 64, uh, subcritical manner, excuse me, of about 63 um, bar. So nice subcritical operation today. And then the, obviously your, your MT and LT at its respective suctions um, to maintain the cooling. Uh, the cooling and your receiver pressure sitting about 38 bar. So the high pressure valve, the effect it has is reducing the pressure from your discharge from 65 bar down to 38 bar. Um, okay, Ricardo will move around for us just to show that each rack also is equipped with a electronic board. So that's the control panel. Within the control panel, you will find your controllers controlling the high pressure valves at uh, operation of your system. All lead compressors are fitted with variable speed drives. Um, so that does give you the, the efficiency control and the capacity control. Um, then looking at the oil separators, there basically we can see the parallel compressors. And then looking at the oil separator side of life, on the far left, the VFTs can be displayed. Um, oil separators, all everything is probably, um, as Ken mentioned, everything is fitted with high pressure special um, uh, equipment designed, manufactured, and supplied for CO2 purposes. Um, mostly on your discharge size, having a pressure of up to 130 bar. Um, so I think one thing that you can see here and one thing we can showcase is um, because especially when working on the oil separator, um, the oil separator's function is to have the discharge pressure and high pressure run through it to separate the oil and bring it back to the compressors. Um, so this point of entry basically is your highest pressure point of entry. Uh, so good practice is to have your oil separator bypassed um, and then also to again have an access point for to allow your technician access into the facility. So basically common practice with servicing and changing your oil separator filter would be to bypass your oil separator. Um, oil separator. Uh, your system can continue to run, so there is no downtime and there is no worries about standstill pressures or having your, your system not cooling at the moment while you have to change that. And that allows the technicians and yourselves to have the time to relieve the pressure out of the oil separator in a controlled manner through the through access points and ball valves um, allowed for. And then once the pressure has been reduced, allows you access into the receiver to uh, into the oil separator to change and remove the oil oil filters. Um, that also gives you peace of mind, like I said, having an operational system that good refrigeration practice can be obtained, having where a quick vacuum can be pulled before the system is purged again with CO2 um, and open up to the rest of the, the facility. When purging a CO2 system with CO2, while I'm on that topic, it's when starting up a system, it's always good to remember um, that CO2 has a very high triple point um, of about 5.8 bar. So good practice is to have vapor introduced into your system up until a minimum of 10 bar uh, before liquid is introduced into the system. Um, the common reason for that is if liquid is introduced into the system below five bar, dry ice will form. Um, and that can take you quite some time to then try and get rid of the, the dry ice within the system. Um, so then Ricardo has also just showed us some of the equipment that we can 
see or utilize within the within the installation um, on the installation side as well and not just on the racks. So basically within a CO2 system as well, um, electronic expansion the valves are utilized at the evaporators or the cabinets. Um, this gives you firstly good control, it leads to energy efficiency. So within your installation side of life, um, each evaporator and each cooling point will be equipped with an electronic expansion valve and a pressure transducer to control your cooling at your um, evaporators. Um, high pressure ball valves all, um, are utilized and ball valves equipped with the sufficient energy, um, sufficient pressure rating to adhere to your design pressure. So, um, I mean, today these valves are freely available um, and also um, fitted with copper alloy fittings. So even a copper alloy fitting ball valve that can be braced or, or um, silver soldered has a pressure rating of up to 130 bar. Um, stainless steel ball valves are available if that is a preference and that is a recommend um, or a requirement. Um, and then also basically you can see like that is your, your copper alloy um, piping that can be utilized. Um, one way of, of also distinguishing between having the right um, piping utilized is if you do have a magnet freely available, a copper alloy will attract the magnet and the magnet will be stuck to that and not to a normal standard um, copper piping. Um, so also basically your pressure relief valves, which is one of the safety, the important safety aspects within a system is to have these relief valves according to your design pressure. Um, so either from your media, your low temp suction would be equipped with 30, 35 bar pressure relief valves, medium temp suction, 45 up to 50 or 60 bar. And your discharge common practice is to have it up to 130 bar pressure relief valves uh, to protect the system and to just from a safety point of view. Um, it's also good practice not to ensure that within your system you don't isolate any CO2 and especially CO2 liquid um, as this will basically when it heats up will go to its corresponding pressure and might exceed your your installation um, design pressure um, and if it's not exposed to a safety relief out and trapped or isolated can can cause um, your system to perhaps burst um, so i think that was hopefully a good introduction and hopefully some hopefully everybody could see that a bit so thank you ricardo for your side i appreciate the help um, and i'm sure that there might be probably some Q and A's from from Devon or anybody else. This was fantastic. I was actually about to encourage you to keep going. Uh, if there, if there is anything else you like to show uh, from the facility, any any part of the system, because I think this is extremely valuable for the for the industry, knowing that we don't have any CO two transcritical system up and running in, in in Philippines as of now. So I think this is this is a lot of uh, useful information. Now maybe we can start with a question. What would you advise uh, to local manufacturers, local contractors that are interested in building the system themselves, or, or you know, putting together had a hands-on experience? Where is the best time, best place to start when it comes to designing and manufacturing the CO2 system? Well, I think the, the best place. Sorry, I'm just getting some feedback on a mic. Um, the best place probably, like you say, is to, I think to get some hands-on experience. Um, there is a lot of facilities internationally um, around the globe available for hands-on and training of contractors and, and OEMs. Um, that's always a good place to, to get started and start learning into it. Um, there's a lot of online training facilities as well. Um, but I think probably the, it's always difficult and especially today's time um to travel abroad and to to move around to to go and see these facilities so it would be great it is great and it is advised to have a facility and that's why i did mention in the beginning as well to have a facility that mimics and looks close as possible to what you would find in a supermarket or industrial application where people are freely available to come around and get their hands on it um, Secondly, I think the thing always that everybody asks me, like, where's the best to get your experience? Like, it sometimes is a catch uh, 22 and it's a, 
a bit of a egg and uh, chicken and egg situation but the best way to get experience is to get your hands on your first actual project um, i think that everybody there's no more motivation than having an actual project to go so i think probably to get this in kicked off in a country and i think what we had probably in south africa which we were fortunate enough to have about 10 years ago is to have a um have an end user support and have the trust in you to to take that step and move forward all right thank you just a follow-up question and we have a two questions from the delegates in terms of where is the best place to start when we talk about the first CO2 to transcritical system uh, in a country is it easier to work with a small condensing unit or would you jump right away into the large industrial project uh, does it make a big difference what's the learning curve for CO2 transcritical like um good question <laughs> i can talk out of just my ex my own experience like jumping into it was in retail applications um that was where co2 predominantly saw its its um, biggest intro um i think today for instance we saw r290 um being presented which is a i do agree i think is a very good um, technology for supermarkets and especially smaller convenient type stores so i would probably say from a practical point of view i would look at your larger or maybe even small and light industrial applications um you within light industrial application the reason i say that is because you do have a little bit of a longer lead time and time frame usually um, depicted with these systems um, which can get you um, exposure and access to to the support that you need from from um, your suppliers or oems or or third party um, support to help you get through the process um, so I, I would say like basically you could start anywhere but i would say for a continuity point of view i would i would start with a larger type of systems um from a large retail or a, a light industrial type of system uh to get you really the full experience of co2 uh, and because i think it, it would be it's easier to work on a condensing unit after you had experience with a larger type system than it is to have a is than it is to jump from a condensing unit to a larger type system Thank you. Thank you. And then actually, there are first discussions on the ground in the Philippines about the CO2 transcritical project uh, that would hopefully be coming online next year. So we'll stay tuned uh, and keep on uh, informing the industry about the progress. We have a question from the audience, and it's about what type of oil is used in the system and what software is used to estimate the energy benefits. Uh, can you please elaborate or maybe ask uh, Ricardo to jump in? Uh, so from an oil point of view, like polyester oil is used um, within most of these systems. Um, PAG oil can be used as well. So there's there's benefits and negatives to both of them. Um, the benefit of the POE oil is it's highly miscible with CO2. So you get a good carry back with, with um, of oil within your system. So CO2 carries POE oil very well. Um, within a ejector system, for instance, or flooded type systems, you would like to perhaps use PAG um, oil as it's not as miserable with CO2, so it's easily extractable out of a receiver. Um, because utilizing an ejector system, for instance, you don't have your suction coming back to your medium term compressor the whole time, and oil needs to be extracted out of the system. So then PAG would be recommended. Uh, but I would say probably about 80% plus 90% of the system seen in the in the field will make is making use of polyester oil. Um, then, sorry, I forgot the second part. <laughs> it is being used to to evaluate the, the performance and the energy. Uh, okay, so yeah, they, I mean, the performance of the LRG, like, firstly, you have, um, it's your, your standard, um, you can have your energy, your power consumption measured, but there is a lot of, um, I think even some of the controllers, even some of the controller suppliers have COP measurement tools um, and stuff that can be added onto the system. So um, mostly it is power consumption and it will go back to a linear, if you need to compare it with additional or alter or other types of systems it will go back to linear metrage of cooling um to to um compare it on an apples to apples basis excellent uh, next question we have them coming now so we'll keep going for another two or three minutes when the unit is not operating how do you manage the high pressure of co2 
So, okay, let's do, so there's a few things there that you can look at. Firstly, your design pressure can be considered. If you do design your um, system to be um, overall have an 80 bar or up to a 90 bar um, pressure rating, you will you are able to control the pressures without any additional uh, measures being added into the system. So that is one aspect is you can have a system to design for um, up to those pressures. Uh, all the equipment is available today. Your expansion devices, even the low-temp compressors today are available to adhere to these pressures. Um, second of all, you would have a UPS system within your um, system. So even if so, if your standstill or your system is not running because of a power failure or something like that, you will have your high pressure valve and your flash gas valve and you control, control these valves and isolate pressures in the where it is required. Um, and second of all, you can basically have either an auxiliary system running to cool the receiver down and, and maintain your um, your pressures within your receiver. Um, a common system, even a standard system that is not rated at a high pressure and does not is not equipped with an auxiliary system, does have a good five, six, seven, up sometimes up to eight hours, depending on the insulation. Um, that it can stand still before it would actually lose a charge. So, so today there is a lot of ways. I know even in New Zealand, for instance, the pressure is rated for up to 80 bar overall because of all the earthquakes going on and stuff like that. They do have sometimes a lot of power outages for up to weeks. Um, and these systems can maintain the pressure and with all the CO2 in them. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be working with true experts when it comes to CO2 and you have such a rich experience. Can, can you just, in, in the end, uh, final question, can you tell us what motivates you to work with these solutions? What drives you? Because you have been working with CO2 for, what, 15 years by now? Yeah, it's been about 15 years. Um, what drives me is like, firstly, I think it's, and I think it's not just me, it's one thing I do experience, and that's um, with everybody that gets their hands on it, is it's, 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 a, it's a very nice challenge, and it's very, I think naturals being introduced into the industry is not just from a sustainable point of view, the right thing to do and the only thing that we have to do, but even looking at the, at the team before me having the presentation about R290, you can see the excitement being brought back into refrigeration. Um, with people having to look at new challenges and uh, it's it's fun. <laughs> so I guess my motivation is to support the industry. What gets me up is to is to see naturals and help naturals get into the industry. Um, I, I keep on, everybody always says like, um, but there's a lot of people doing it. But the sad thing today is 95% of what is out there currently installed is not running on natural refrigerants, especially in the retail industry. And we don't have a lot of time and we need to, to move to, to convert these systems to to naturals, to not only adhere to energy saving, to reduce the demand on, on grid power, but also to, to work towards us hitting our Kigali amendment and hitting the Montreal Protocol guidelines to, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Uh, very well put. Uh, I think that what, what we have witnessed last 10 years in, in the refrigeration industry when it comes to sustainable solutions, clean cooling, is so much innovation that's perhaps more than last 50 uh, in industrial and commercial, like commercial. So it's exciting uh, to be part of this industry. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you and Ricardo uh, for joining us for this very, very interesting uh, presentation and the technical training workshop. We will be back with more, uh, I'm sure. But um, uh, on, on behalf of uh, the team and all delegates, thank you very, very much for joining.